So, um, in true deconstructive practice, I think the first thing is to talk about what do we mean by in a dis disruptive innovation. So, I'm taking it backwards. Coming from the historical library, of course, I went to my shorter Oxford dictionary, which um, has a very interesting definition of innovation. I'm sorry you probably can't read it at the back, but the most interesting thing about the definition is that innovation is basically about doing something new. So there's no real nuance about it. it's, it's particularly clever to do something new or being innovative is somehow very exciting. It's simply doing something new. The thing I like most is one of the examples given was the church in Scotland had a schism in the 1500s, I think it was 1600s, and the ones who broke away were called the, the disruptors and, and they had changed the religion at the time. So when we look at disruption, innovation in religion was often saying we don't agree with what the, uh, you know, the orthodox people say, but of course innovation could get your head chopped off or get um, you saw burned at the stake back in the uh, 1500s. Um, and disruption comes from a little bit later. The thing I like about disruption is that the definition is to burst asunder. So there's this wonderful notion about disruption is that you disrupt something and it bursts asunder and I think that's really interesting. And then there were people who tried to break up the government and they were called disruptors. And this is where you get the, um, the church of Scotland. It was um, actually 1843. 451 ministers protested against the Orthodox Church. And they were the disruptors and they went off and made a terrible mess. So I'll put it back to front. But disruptive innovation, to me, the disruption is really the interesting bit. The innovation actually is a fairly neutral term. There's probably some things that are new, which are actually quite worthless. So just being new by itself doesn't necessarily mean anything. Um, so I'm going to do a very, very quick tour through SOAS. And anybody who's been to SOAS Library will recognize the slides. That's our Tamil priest at the front. One of the easiest ways to disrupt things is to have a building project. So one of the first disruptions we did at SOAS was start with the old library. And if you were there in 2008, you would have seen the library looking like this. And the library was full of books. So SOAS was a print library back in the, right up until 2008, 2009. And it was heavily, heavily focused on print. And in fact, the first time I walked into the library and went up into the main reading room, the first impression I had was of what I called the terrifying presence of books. <laughs> you, could, you could smell them, you could see them, you could feel them. They were wrapped all around this main reading room. So it's a, it's a tiered reading room. And at that point, the library had been designed for 900,000 volumes and it had 1.35 million in the, in the library because the stacks had just been stacked up and stacked up and stacked up. So we got to work and thought we have to do something about this because we were supposed to be uh, stabilizing our print holdings. And we went about a disruption. And the slide will stop at a certain point. I think that's probably it. Um, one of the good ways to disrupt something is to take it to pieces. So <laughs> if you want to really be disruptive, get the builders in. We had a challenge which was to renovate this floor to library. That used to be a reading room, so that one's long gone. So the classic library at SOAS was a built, built in a building that really looks a bit like an underground car park. In fact, when it was all stripped out, you could actually go in and drive around. I rode my bicycle around it. Um, that pile of earth was exactly where the head of technical services desk used to be. So, uh, <laughs> and this was when we were getting to work building. So the interesting thing about this, there were two, two things that came out of this. Um, we wanted to renovate. There were too many books in the library. We had to send 20% of the books off-site just in order to do the renovation. We only could renovate one floor. The, the rear guard action against sending the books away was quite astonishing. The academics went into a nervous breakdown and they spent quite a lot of money and quite a lot of time getting engineers in to work out could we reinforce the building to bring all of the books back. It turned out we couldn't. It would have cost us eight million pounds. It would have meant ripping up all the floors, reinforcing them. The building probably would have fallen over at some point when it was being ripped to bits. So we finally had to send 20% of the stock off site. The librarians were in a state of denial and they said, no, we can't believe that you're even going to do this. And so I said, well, Yes, we are. No, you're not. Yes, we are. No, you're not. I finally said, well, the navvies will come in and take the books, whether you selected them or not. And they said, we don't believe you. And the, the navvies came in and they took the books away. 
and we spent two more years sorting them out in the off-site store. So this was hugely disruptive. Now, several years later, we have books, location in the catalogue, off-site, call it back from store. It's perfectly normal. Everybody else seems to do it. Um, I was advised by one librarian, don't do it, and somebody else told me, who's not here today, the best thing ever happened to that particular library was the off-site store got flooded and they just threw it all away. Uh, so these are innovations that you decide on. Then we got to work and we built this, this wonderful new library. So technology started to move in. We opened up spaces. You actually saw daylight at the end of um, some of the corridors where you never saw daylight before. So the first disruption for SOAS was fewer books, more space for users. This is one of the terraces. The terraces are lovely under this um, concrete ceiling. It's apparently a 20th century monument. It's registered by the English Heritage as a at the English Historical Society as a 20th century monument. Um, we can't touch it now because it's grade two so listed and it's a, it's a heroic modernist building. But you'll notice, if you remember the early slide, the wonderful reading room with no computers, suddenly computers are everywhere. So we've, we've transformed the physical library and it was quite disruptive. A previous librarian said that they didn't like the noise of the keyboards clacking. <laughs> in the main reading room. So a previous librarian had taken all of the computers out of the reading room because the noise on the keyboard apparently was disruptive. But um, anyway. So moving on, the next thing we looked at was technology. And what the, the, the real theme of this talk is about the effect of changing technology on library culture. We got involved with the other Bloomsbury library libraries. That at that, that time, there were six Bloomsbury colleges. The librarians used to get together every month or two, and we used to talk about shared services. We must have a shared service. This was at the peak when shared service was the buzzword, and so we must have a shared service. We tried to get a shared service off-site store. That didn't work. So we thought, let's have a shared service library system. We also wanted it to be next generation, whatever that means, and we wanted it to be preferably open source. And open source is, is the critical, critical point here. Um, I can say quite a lot about why open source. But there were a number of things that bound us together. And this, this is a very important element for me about how do you make a shared service successful. You have to have something that makes you want to collaborate, to cooperate. And we all had a shared ethos. In fact, I would assert that libraries generally have a shared ethos. Libraries are very interesting organizations. They are very collaborative by nature. Um, you know, SOAS Library started as a holding library back in 100 years ago. The notion of we held the collections that we could send out to anybody to the lending library. So the notion of a circulating library, a holding library goes back a long way. So there's a shared ethos. There's a strong emphasis on collaboration. Anybody who works in any UK library will know that you can be part of SCONL or Rural UK <coughs> or M25 consortium, or in our case, the Federal Libraries Group of University of London or Liber or etc, etc, etc. Libraries naturally collaborate. One of the interesting things about collaboration is that you cannot control the outcome. So if you go into a collaboration with an intention, and it's a genuine collaboration, you come out the other end of it and something happens, but you cannot necessarily say that you could control or predict the outcome, and you may not necessarily be able to reproduce it. So if, for example, we started again today, I'm sure we'd end up with a different outcome. There's a wonderful reference there to that. And of course we had this basis for collaboration. We did a map and we said, of all these libraries, what are all the different things that we're members of? So University of London, UK, BC librarians. 94 group, anybody remember the 94 group? <laughs> we were in that one as well. And the final thing was about technology. We really wanted to change technology and change the way we related to technology. And this is quite important. Um, if you go to the etymology of technology, Technology really predates anything to do with computers or what we would currently call information technology or in, you know, information technology. It's an organized art and craft with a framework for propagation. So you could say, maybe being a little bit um, ambitious, that libraries are technologies. They, they, they mobilize technologies. The, the, the technologies mobilized by libraries have been around a long, long time. This business with IT is very recent by comparison with what libraries get up to. And part of my thesis, if I manage to get through in time, is to say that what we set about doing was trying to get the librarians 
to reclaim the capability to say that we are technologists and we are in control of the technology. The technology is not controlling us. So the Bloomsbury Librarians got together and said, we particularly want open source because of open. And I'll say a bit more about that in a second. But we wanted to be systematic about this. So we got the suppliers that we had relationships with in, sorry, relationships with in and said, tell us your roadmap. Don't try to sell us anything. Tell us what you think your systems will look like in five years' time. And we started from where we were at that time. We all had these black boxes in our basement somewhere. Some people here may still have a black box in the basement. There's this thing called a turnkey system. The, the supplier puts a machine in, turns it on, and off you go. Um, in fact, I was fascinated yesterday by the, the metaphor about farmers giving their produce to supermarkets and then having to buy it back at excessive profit margins. Some of you who were here may have heard that. Wonderful notion. We have this black box. I'm not going to name the supplier of the black box with all our data in it. We had to pay a lot of money to that supplier to get our data out of that black box. So it has resonance with the notion of having to buy back something you own because it's been put inside somebody else's box. Um, and that was the sort of landscape we had back in 2008, 2009. The key word is frustration in the middle. There's a black box. We wrapped all these sort of bolt-ons around the black box in the middle. But the one bit we couldn't really get at was the black box. And the black box was where all of our data lived. I don't expect you to read that slide from the back. So then the vendors came along and there was some of them are outside. I don't know if they're in the room listening to me to be, see if I'm going to be rude about them or not, so I won't name any of them. Um, but the primary model that was shown to us for five years in the future was we will take everything you've got and put it in this ginormous database somewhere in this cloud that you don't have to worry about, and then we'll just deliver a service back to you through this cloud thing. Don't worry about the cloud. That's something you don't need to worry about. You know, that's that big people do clouds, and you're just librarians, so you you'll get your stuff back, but don't worry about it. So this was a model that we looked at, and it came with a couple of variations. One variation was that you've got your internal services, and there's some sort of pro promise that you'll be able to connect through proprietary APIs, and you've got all your data in there, and then you get these services through <coughs> web interfaces. And then there's another model where they said, oh, you can write your own little apps. We've got this wonderful big cloud, and it's got these APIs around it, and you can write little apps to talk to the cloud. And we thought, well, hmm, OK, that's interesting. Um, it does give us some challenges. So um, I'll go on to the next one. Then we had open source people came in, and the Qualio lay people came in, and they showed us a diagram that looked like that. And they also showed us one that looked like that. And what was interesting about this was they were saying, here is the technology. We're quite happy to show you everything about the technology and show you where the data lives, show you how the connections happen between the bits and pieces of data and so on. And this struck a chord with us for a couple of reasons. And this is where it does get a bit ideological. Um, so the primary reason, I think, comes back to the ethos of a research library. So if we're a research library and our job is holding precious things, which historically were print-type things, um, and we're moving into an environment where we treat our vital data as precious things that we want to hold on to. Um, going back a step or two to these models, um, that's a good one. Oops, too far. If we've got vital data that's about how we run our library, do we actually want to give all of that data to somebody to hold in some enormous database somewhere else. And this, this is quite a key point about the open, why I say open is the key thing here. Um, it's all very well to say bibliographic data. Everybody shares bibliographic data. We're all on WorldCat, we're on Copac, we're on Suncat. So there's no particular problem with bibliographic data. But when you run a library, you've got patron data, you've got financial data, you've got the data about what you've purchased and who's actually borrowed that data. You've got circulation data. You've got all of this data about your library, the, the, the basic operational data about the library. If you put all of that data in somebody else's database, and in the earlier model I showed you that in, even when the database was on our premises, we couldn't get the data back out of the system, are you actually comfortable with that 
model. And certainly the question that we asked ourselves was, are we comfortable? And the answer was, no, we're not. Now, as things have moved on a little bit, um, the suppliers I'm not allowed to be rude about are actually involved in quite a big bit of vertical integration business that's going on at the minute. So there is a well-known supplier of a ginormous database that they deliver through the cloud that's recently been purchased by a well-known supplier of content. So you've now got a vertical integration setting in. Um, one of the interesting questions is, do you for a minute believe that they're not applying big data analysis to the ginormous database? Of, yeah. Do you for a minute believe that they're not analysing what you're buying, who's using it, what you're circulating, etc., etc., particularly because they've got an interest in selling you something? Um, maybe I'm a cynic. Um, interesting observation. I was in Copenhagen and I was talking to the librarians from Sweden and from Denmark and they said to me, we are not by law allowed to keep records of what people have borrowed. So there's a privacy question. Somebody borrows something, it's against the law in the Scandinavian countries to even keep the record. So you cannot keep a record of what people have borrowed. Um, somewhere on the ALA website there's a wonderful quote in the um, ALA charter that says, we believe in the privacy of reading. Very interesting. It's like, it's almost like a First Amendment right, the, the right to free speech also includes the right to read privately, to not be scrutinised for what you're reading. So if you're putting your information about your patrons into these ginormous databases, what are you giving away? Interesting question. So then we decided to go for Qualio Lane. This is giving a little bit of information about, about what we were on before. Um, <laughs> Some people may recognize this screen. But, um, I actually had librarians who said, can you please give us back the VT220 terminals because we really like the function key to put the, <laughs> the top. So this was up until two and a half years ago we were running through this interesting system and, and we had this wonderful catalog. It doesn't quite, don't, don't read really really where that came from. Um, and so one of the first things we did, and this was where the collaboration came into play, we said, we really want to do much better discovery than this, because this was an example of, I forget, I think there were sort of 12 different places you could click. So we had these wonderful user sessions saying, if you're looking for this, click this one, but if you don't find it, click that one, and if you don't find it, click over here, and then maybe if you still get lost, click somewhere else. Um, and we wanted to put up better discovery, so we went to, and that's an example of what you got when you click through. Um, we went to something called Open Source Viewfind, this was the first thing we did in the project, was put up a system called ViewFind. And we did this collaboratively with the other libraries. And I actually programmed the prototype of this myself. It took a whole Saturday uh, downloading the code and just following the, the scripts. It's a fabulous system. It's um, a system that I call it the Swiss Army Knife of Discovery. Within several days, we worked out that you could discover what was in our bibliographic database, what was in our ePrints repository. Um, technically, you can discover what's in uh, our CALM system, although we're still fighting with that little bit. Um, so the first thing we did before we moved the underlying system was put up this new discovery interface. So in terms of use, moving the users, we moved the users first to a much richer interface. And that's an example when you drill down of the faceted search. And if I was brave and had more time, I'd do you a live demonstration of it. Um, and then we migrated onto Qualio Lay. This is, this is the other point when it gets rather controversial. Um, Qualio Lay was set up under the Qualio Foundation, which I think I've got a slide here. There's the Qualio Foundation. So when we decided to go for Qualio Lay, we joined the Qualio Foundation, which is an American foundation dedicated to building open source software for running universities on. So in the Qualio system, you've got finance, you've got research, there's a student system, the open library environment. So there's a whole system, a foundation wrapped around the production of this software. So in terms of open source, and I'm going to have to start rushing because I can see the clock at the back there, there's two key things about open source that's persuaded us on Coalio Lake. The first one is open. If, like us, you're on a proprietary system and you decide you do not like the supplier, you have to change systems to get to a different supplier because it's proprietary. If you're on an open source system and the system does the job you want to do and you don't like the supplier, go find another supplier. You don't have to migrate your system because the system is open source. So with ViewFind, for example, 
we discovered there's quite a market. There's, there's several companies who can program ViewFind for us. So if we don't like the program we're getting from one company, we can go to somebody else. So open source means that you're not locked into a proprietary code base in terms of how, where you get your programming and your support from. The other thing is with open is, is there some assurance around the software that it's actually safe? And this was where the Koali Foundation came in. There's an entire infrastructure around how this software is developed and built. So we adopted the Quali OLA. We became the third library in the world to go live on this system in April last year. Um, and we've made considerable progress. Again, <coughs> at the back you won't be able to see this, but this is, this is the new environment that we've managed to build based on the fact that it's an open system. So, so the key thing is in the middle is a completely open stack which uses standard databases like MySQL. You can do a standard SQL calls. You can interrogate the database. <coughs> You can program scripts to make the thing do what you want it to do. You've got web interfaces. You've got APIs into different system integration. We've managed to build a whole system of integration into our user identity management system so that we don't hold much about our patrons on the library system because the data is in user identity management and so on. Um, so it's actually a much richer environment. It does require quite a lot of resource. So these are some of the universities. Some of these are not there anymore. I think Florida, for example, would probably uh, raise eyebrows at this. Um, and those are our partners. So moving very rapidly at this point, about <coughs> cultural change. So partly it's about technology and partly it's about cultural change. So what has happened in the SOAS library as a consequence of doing this is that librarians who saw themselves as the consumers of, passive consumers of technology delivered by somebody else have had to become active engagement, have, have active engagement collaborators in the whole process of software design and delivery. And the Koali system has this very interesting structure where there's subject matter experts, there's project people, there's functional and technical councils, then there's project management and the board. So there's a, there's a whole infrastructure built around collaboration. And so every librarian who wants to, key being wants to, can join some group or other. And so I've got librarians who are on telephone calls on an almost weekly basis. Subject matter experts are looking into uh, different elements of the software. So you get these modules down the bottom. Describe is the bibliographic module. Deliver is the circulation module. Selector and acquire is the acquisitions module. There are subject matter expert groups across the partner libraries who are talking about what are the functional requirements that we have for the system to do what we need to do. That then gets fed up. This is a new model using a, what's called an agile method that gets fed up into product council that then briefs development teams to do this. And this, is, this has transformed the relationship between the library and technology in two critical ways. The first one is that their librarians are now talking language that they never believed they would use before. Things like the test, the dev, the production server, the, the patches that are being loaded, the JIRAs that you fill in to, to, to log something going wrong. I've got um, IT staff who used to say to me, there's corporate systems and there's library systems and they're two different things. And I've now got corporate system staff who say, oh, library systems, they're actually corporate systems, aren't they? You actually need those to work, don't you? So we will actually worry <laughs> about those, which is quite a big transformation. Librarians talking to IT people. Head of ICT comes in the morning and worries about whether the library sentry system is working or not. Whereas five years ago, if the sentry system was down, the subject librarian, sorry, the system librarian ran around slapping his hand saying it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and people would say, oh, we'll get back to you on that one. And um, they didn't off quite often. So then there's all these architectural views. So I'm just going to go right to the end, try to stop on time. Anybody who did cultural theory will probably recognize this. Um, my cultural theory degree back in the 70s was very interested in the way the crossover between psycho, psycho something or other discourse and linguistic discourse. And a lot of the discussion came down to the notion of subject, object, and then abject. So Julia Kristeva had this theory about abject, which is quite interesting. And my, my theory about libraries and technology is that there's been for too long a sense of abjection in the face of technology. <coughs> so this is the theory that that we're librarians, we do library, and there's this thing over there called technology that somebody else is doing, and we really don't know anything about it, and we can't control it, and somehow it's controlling us. So as, as subjects, 
we're no longer the subject and the object. The librarian is in charge of the library, that's the subject, the object. But somehow the technology has become the subject and the librarian has become the object of the technology and that the, the relationship has gone awry. So my theory is that there's a state of abjection which people get into in the face of technology. And the, the key thing is to try to break out of that state. So objection is a state of being stuck in the middle somewhere, in this theory. It's got to do with the, the disturbance of identity, system and order. So anybody who's studied library science will know about identity, system and order. You want things to be really well, well organized and to work. But this technology has come along and disrupted the whole field. And you've got these technologists, some of them are sitting outside this room, saying, don't worry about it, we'll just do it all for you. It's safe, you don't have to worry, we'll just deliver you this managed service. But what they're actually doing is delivering to you a, f a highly mediated service where the control has moved outside of your domain. So fundamentally, for me, the disruption of the qualio lay is that we've tried to move the control back into the domain of the library. That's my point.